Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at um, the third lecture. This is the last lecture for Unit 1, where we're going to start looking at um, uh, the normal model and z-scores. And so this is kind of fun. We have some um, applications that I think you're going to find interesting, or at least I do. And also, this is going to um, help you with your homework. So I hope the le lecture's not too long, but remember, you can pause and take a break and come back to it because there's lots of good stuff in here on how to help you with your online homework, especially using Excel to get our um, percentages with the normal model. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so again, if you want to read in your textbook, you should look at chapters five and six. Uh, we'll look at z-scores and working with a normal model. So what sometimes what we want to do is we want to compare very different looking values, and the trick to doing that is using standard deviations as our ruler. In the textbook, they talk about the pentathlon, which is kind of interesting as the Olympics are coming up, um, which is a race that has several different components in it. There's a, there's a, I mean, there's it's a contest in the Olympics which has five different events, and and the events are very different. Some are based on time, some are based on distance, and so you want to figure out who's the best when you have all those different races when you're involved with all those different races, and so um, they uh, try to figure out how you compare to a particular race using um, your standard deviation. So the standard deviation tells us how the whole collection of values varies, so it's a natural ruler for comparing an individual to a group. As the most common measure of variation, the standard deviation plays a crucial role in how we look at data. So we remember how to find the standard deviation. You find the deviations, you square them, you divide by n minus 1, and you take the square root, or you just use the cool standard deviation button on your calculator. So um, we can compare individual data value to their mean relative their to their standard deviation using the formula for what's called a z-score. And what you do is you do data value minus mean divided by standard deviation. And we call the resulting value standardized values, and it's denoted as z, and they can also be called z-scores. And what's interesting about that is if you do a data value, say you're talking about minutes, and the mean is minutes, and you divide by the standard deviation, which is also in minutes, you're going to do minutes minus minutes, so that unit's going to be minutes, divided by minutes, so you're not going to have any units in the end, so you're just going to have this raw number that's going to be like a ruler for you. So they have no units, um, z-scores measure the distance each data value is from the mean in, standard, in terms of standard deviations, it tells you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So if you have a negative z-score, that data value is below the mean, while a positive z-score tells us that the data value is above the mean. Standardized values have been converted from their original units to standardized statistical unit of standard deviations from the mean. So it tells you how many standard deviations that data value is from the mean. So it's like a, it's a measure. Thus, we can compare values that are measured on different scales with different units or from different populations. And that's where our example comes in. Now, um, you may not know that I'm actually a competitive marathon runner, and in 2008, when I had the last name Brooks, I, completed it the, I competed in the two, uh, 2008 Route 66 Tulsa Marathon, and I was the overall female champion. But in 2009, the next race that I ran um, was in the Oklahoma City Marathon, and the conditions were quite different. It was very hot and very windy. I ended up being the third overall female finisher with a much slower finish time, and I was a little bit disappointed in my um, results because I had felt like I had really put in some more work since the Tulsa race, and I thought I would have a better um, time. So what I did was I said, wait a second, because the conditions were different, let me compute my z-scores for each race and talk about the significance of them. Okay, so you can go to a website called MarathonGuide.com and you can actually find the results for all the races, all the different marathons. And notice you can see the, um, the average finish time. You can get the standard deviation. Here I was the winner, so that's my finish time, which you can look up. You can look up all the different people. You know, there were 352 women and, um, you know, you can see your place and that sort of thing. And then here, um, in, in the Oklahoma City, you get the same thing. You get the average finish time, the standard deviation. And now, in this case, since I was third, we just get the, um, the uh, my time as compared to the winner who ran a 310. Okay, so let's take this information and let's try and com um, compute z-scores. And I kind of, in, in the interest of time, I did this already in Excel, but I'm going to walk you through what I did because um, it, kind of, it was kind of interesting. 
let me just uh, delete these cells real quick. Okay, so what I did is I took my time in, or I looked at the mean, the standard deviation, and my time in, um, in Tulsa. And then I needed to convert these because this was in hours, minutes, and seconds. I needed to convert it to just minutes. And so in, in um, Excel, what you want to do, one thing you want to do is you want to format these cells so that they're numbers. So I'm going to hold the shift key down and I'm just going to highlight these cells. And then if you right click, you can select format the cells and you want to choose that they are under number. You want to choose that they actually are a number. You don't want them to be just general. So uh, that's what I did there. And then the other thing that I did was um, you can, this is called a timestamp in Excel. Just um, you can convert that to minutes or seconds if you want by um, multiplying by the, this cell by the number of whatever unit you want there are in a day. So there are 1,440 um, minutes in a day. You just do 60 times 60 because there's 60 minutes. I'm sorry, you do uh, 60 times 24 to get 1,440. And then if you multiply the timestamp times that, you will get um, it converted into minutes. Now you could just do this with your brain, like this one's easy. Three hours and two minutes is three sets of 60. That's 180 plus the two minutes. So that's where the 182 comes from. And the 46 seconds, that's 46 out of 60. So if you just come over here and if you just think, okay, equals 46 divided by 60 as a decimal, that's the 0.77 that they're getting there. So this is just a cool little function or a cool little thing in Excel. If you take the timestamp and multiply what you by the number of times intervals that you want in a day, so in this case there's 1,440 minutes in a day, it'll convert it to minutes for you. So I did that for Tulsa, and then I also did it for Oklahoma using the data values. Now, in order to compute my z-scores, I just came right here and I said data value, which was um, what's in C5, minus the mean, which was what was in C3, and I divided by the standard deviation, which was what was in C4. Now, notice I did put these parentheses around the numerator, because you do data value minus mean divided by standard deviation, you have to put those in parentheses. And I did the same thing for my Oklahoma City results, except I used the times in Oklahoma City. So I did the data value, which was E5, minus the mean, which was in E3, and divided by the standard deviation, which was in E4. And I got these two numbers. And so now I have to think, well, what, what is it that these numbers actually mean? Well, um, this is the number of standard deviations I was away from the mean. Now, the fact that it's to the left means that I was below the mean, which should make sense to you because the average time was 4 hours and 27 minutes. I finished in 3 hours and 2 minutes, so I was definitely to the left in the mean. And in, in fact, in terms of standard deviations, I was 1 and about 3 quarters of a standard deviation. What does that mean? Well, 47 minutes, I was more than 47 minutes away because it was... Um, Three, if you look at this difference, 20, 267 minus 182. So if we just do this number, this my data value minus my mean, that's 80. Oops, sorry, that's 84 minutes apart. And in terms of standard deviations, well, if I just divide by the standard deviations, that's about 1.75 standard deviations, negative 1.75 standard deviations. So it just gives you kind of a measure to see um, where you are. All right, so let's go back because that's how you compute a z-score. Data value minus mean divided by standard deviation. Now, one thing, I, and we'll get to this in a minute, but the fact, the truth is I was further, I had a, a I was further from the mean in Oklahoma City than I was in uh, Tulsa. So this means compared to the population, I actually did better in Oklahoma City than I did in, in Tulsa because I was further away from the average. So um, that, you know, if you're trying to make yourself feel better about your finish time, you can you can use that. And it's interesting because look at the finish time in Oklahoma City was four hours and 50 minutes versus Tulsa is four hours and 27 minutes. If you know anything about running, this particular race in Tulsa was about 32 degrees at the start. 
and we finished in about 50 degree temperature, but Oklahoma City started about um, almost 80 degrees, and so it was really hot and windy, which uh, made all the times take a lot longer. Okay, so that's this idea of z-scores, and that's kind of help you understand that. And we're going to take a minute, in a, in a few minutes, to talk about these, this histogram here for both of these. Um, if you look at these histograms, they, they do seem pretty unimodal and reasonably symmetric, especially the Oklahoma City one. Uh, the, you might say that Tulsa has a bit of a longer tail, but for the, for the Oklahoma City, you do, it does seem unimodal and symmetric, both of those two. Okay, so now let's talk about what we did there, which was what we shifted the data. When we took the data value and we subtracted the mean, we just moved all of the data into, um, we just moved them. So uh, let's think about what would happen if you had the statistics of people's salary and everybody got a year-end bonus of $500. Well, then everybody would just move up $500 and the statistics, remember the statistics are like your mean, your median, um, your mo, or your um, IQR, your standard deviation. Well, let's think about that. If you add $500 to everyone's salary, well, then the mean salary is going to go up by $500. So with the minimum salary, the minimum salary would go up $500. The maximum salary would go up $500. But would the spread change? The spread would not be affected because everybody moved $500. So this takes us to this idea here that adding or subtracting a constant amount to each value just adds or subtracts the same constant um, to or from the mean. And that's also true for the median and other measures of position, or sometimes we call them measures of location. Um, those were, uh, those other measures of location were the min and the max. Those are other, and even your Q1, quartile one, and your Q3. Those, those numbers, if you add 500 to all of them, they're all going to change. But if you, um, it's not going to change the IQR or the standard deviation or the range. It's not going to change the spread, but it will change the measures of center and location. So if you add the same number to the data values, it only changes the measure of center and location. It doesn't change the statistics that measure spread, which are like IQR, uh, range, and uh, standard deviation. Now, if you everyone got a 10% raise, now that is going to make a difference because think about it. If you're make, if you're the highest, if your max is like say you make a hundred dollars and someone else makes one dollar, um, or we could actually do this in Excel. So you, if you have a ten percent raise, let's just come up with some, let's come up with some salaries. So people make maybe it's fifty dollars an hour, and then twenty dollars an hour, or or let me do it in order. So fifty dollars and sixty dollars and then $70, and then $100 an hour. Okay, now if all of these numbers get a 10% raise, then uh, we could come in this cell and we could say equals, and it's gonna be the $50 times, it's a 10% raise, so that's gonna be 110%, or 1.1, uh, um, you know, will give you, m multiply that number by 100, and, or it will be a, <clears throat> When, if you multiply it by 1.1, it's going to give you 110%. So that gives you $55. And then you could come down here and you could get the same numbers. Okay. Now, let's look at the spread. What's the spread here? The range here is 100 minus 50 is $50. But what's the range here? So the range for this one is equal to the max minus the min. I hit enter and I can just come right here and I can drag make it to the small plus sign and just drag it and notice I see that the range is not the same it is not in its 55 it has actually changed of course the mean let's see about the mean the mean here is just equals we can do average and then parenthesis these numbers right here that average is 70. What's this average? It's 
it's going to be 110 percent is 77. So you see that if everybody gets a 10 percent raise then both measures of spread like range, IQR, and standard deviation are going to get increased by 10 percent as are measures of location like the min, the max, um, the, the mean, and the median. Those are measures of location. They also uh, change. So uh, when you multiply or divide a data value by the same number, all the data values by the same number, you change all your statistics by that amount. But if you add or subtract numbers to, this, to all the data values, you only change measures of location. So let's go back to the homework and see that's uh, what we have summarized right there. So let's look at rescaling data as an example. It says each year thousands of high school students take either the SAT or the ACT standardized tests. Combined SAT scores can go as high as 1600, that's if you're just looking at the math and the verbal, uh, while the maximum ACT composite score is 36. Since the two exams use very different scales, comparisons of performance are difficult. A convenient rule of thumb is for the SAT, you take, um, you multiply, to, to predict your SAT score, you take your ATC, ACT score, multiply it by 40, and then add 150 to estimate the equivalent SAT score. So if you have an admissions officer and he reports the following statistics, so he's talking about statistics about the ACT score of 2,355 students who applied to her college, um, let's see what the corresponding SAT score would be. So it seems pretty straightforward when you're working this, and especially on the online homework, you're going to be like, okay, so I'm just going to, do, to get the SAT score, I'm just going to take the SAT, I'm just going to take 40 times whatever the ACT score is, and then add 150. Well, that's only going to be true when you're using measures of location, the min, the median are both measures of location, but the standard deviation is a measure of spread, so you are not going to add the 150 when you're calculating the new standard deviation. So if we want to start with the min, yes, we will do 40 times 19 and then plus 150 to get our new value. And if you want to talk about the median, yes, you will do the SAT score will be 40 times the median, which is 28 plus the 150. But the standard deviation is not affected by adding or subtracting numbers. So the standard deviation for the SAT is just going to be 40 times the 3, because it is affected by multiplication, but you don't add anything else. And so 120 is your standard deviation. And you can get, we can get these other calculations real quick. You know, you're, remember that Excel can be a calculator as well. So if we want to use it just as a calculator, we could come in here and do 40 times, so you start with the equal sign, and then you do 40, and then use the asterisk times 19 plus 150. That gives you the min would be a 910, and then do the equal sign in the cell, and then do 40 times 28 plus 150. Uh, a 1270 is the median, okay? So that's how you could get those numbers, the 910 and 1270. So be careful when you're working this online homework. It's going to seem real easy to get these problems. You're just like, oh, yeah, I just add or subtract, you know. But when you're dealing with measures of spread, which are standard deviation, range, and IQR, you only multiply or um, divide that number. If they're adding the same value to that number, the standard deviation is not going to change. So you just have the same as the original standard deviation. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's go back to this idea of z-scores. If you take all the data values and subtract the mean and then divide by their standard deviation, that's going to shift all of your data values so that your new mean, your new statistic for your mean, well, if you did mean minus the mean and divide by the standard deviation, that's going to be zero. And if you did, um, and if you take the standard deviation and you subtract the mean, remember standard deviation is not affected by add addition or subtraction, so you're just going to do standard deviation divided by standard deviation, which is just one. So when you standardize scores, 
you change the mean of the, the, if you standardized all the scores, the new mean of your new distribution of standardized scores would be zero, and your standard deviation of your uh, Z scores would be one. So it's kind of interesting. So if we had taken all of the people that had done, had, had um, raced in, in Tulsa, and we had converted them into Z scores, and then taken all those z-scores and calculated the mean, it would be zero. The mean of the z-scores would be zero, and the standard deviation of the z-scores would be one, because that's just by the nature of what we're doing. So a z-score gives us an indication of how unusual a value is because it tells us how far it is from the mean. So a negative z-score tells us the data value is below the mean, while a positive tells us it's above the mean. The larger the z-score is negative or positive, the more unusual it is. There's no universal standard, but there is a model that, so, I mean, how, what does that mean, more unusual? Like, let's go back to me, right? Because that was, it's all about me anyway. My Z-score for Tulsa was negative 1.75, and for Oklahoma City, it was negative 1.86. How unusual am I? Was, was I really awesome, or was I not, you know, really that far from the rest of the, the pack? What does that mean? How unusual am I? Well, it turns out that there is a model that shows up all, all over and over in statistics, and that model is called the normal model, and you may have heard of it as called of the bell-shaped curve. And normal models are appropriate for distributions whose shapes are unimodal and roughly symmetric. And um, these distributions provide a measure for how extreme a z-score is. So there's a normal model for every possible combination of mean and standard deviation, um, and we write it, this is kind of notation, and you'll see it in the online homework, they'll say that the distribution is normal, and this mu is the mean, and this little sigma is the standard deviation. Oh, I don't know why that just came up like that, but um, sorry. And the little sigma is the standard deviation. And we use it to represent the normal model. Um, if the data values are standardized, then we are dealing with the standard normal model with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, so coming up here and looking at our graphs for Oklahoma City and Tulsa, we could say that these graphs are roughly symmetric and unimodal, so we could approximate them with the normal model, and in this case we would say it's a normal model, and it has a mean of, of 4 hours and 27 minutes and 5 seconds and a standard deviation of 47.56. That's how we would write it. Because it's, it's roughly, it looks pretty normal. As is Oklahoma City, it actually looks even better. We've got this normal model here that you can, you can kind of feel that that does seem to be appropriate. And so what's so cool about this is you can actually use statistic or... It's actually calculus, but your computer's going to do it for you, so don't worry, you're not doing calculus in here. To figure out, all right, well, what percent of the population was between, I don't know, 3 hours and 30 minutes and 5 hours and 30 minutes? You know, how, what percent of the population finished the race in this time? And what percent of the population finished under 3 hours? And, um, and those are kind of the questions that we ask when we're looking at the normal model. Okay. So let's continue on here. So we have this idea of the normal model. And it's going to give us an idea. It's going to tell us how extreme a z-score is. Now, in order to use the normal model, you have some assumptions. One is that the shape of the distribution is unimodal and the way and symmetric, and you can check that with a histogram. And so again, they tell us how extreme it is to find a value that far from the mean. And I found this, I'm, I've got a 15-year-old daughter, and so we're talking about getting a, a new vehicle for her, or not new to us anyway. And so I was looking at different vehicles on this uh, website, and it gave me a price analysis, and I just thought it was such a great example of the normal model. So this is a 2002 Hyundai Elantra, and the, this particular vehicle that I was looking at had a list price of... Uh, 1, 000, or $13,709. So what they did is they said, well, the market average for this Hyundai Elantra is $15,530. So, and they must know the standard deviation, which they don't give you. 
But what they're saying is they're calling that 13,709, it's significantly far away from the mean. It, they have some measure, and so they're saying, look, there's very few cars that you're going to find that are cheaper than that. Very few 2010 Hyundai Elantras at a better price than that. So they're going to call that a great price. And in the same sense, if your price was over here, above 16149 they would say compared to the market average, that's that's kind of not, not such a good price. Now, they, they call it above market. They don't say it's a bad price. They're just saying for some reason it, it's quite higher than, than what you would expect to pay. So it gives you a good sort of sense, and you can see it's a beautiful example of the normal distribution. Okay, so we can find these numbers precisely um, for, we could say exactly what percent of the data is less than $13,709, or you know, exactly what percent of the runners finished before I did. You can get those numbers precisely, but until then, we're gonna use this super, uh, sorry, simple rule that tells us about the normal model. And it is that in the normal model, 68% of the data values, data values fall within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% of the data values fall within two standard deviations of the mean, and about 99.7, or almost all of values, fall within three standard deviations of the mean. So we have this idea of the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So what this means in our marathon example is that we can expect that 68% of the of the population of runners finished within uh, 47 minutes of the mean, which was four hours and 27 minutes. So on either side of that um, is where you could expect 68% of Okay, so here we're said, um, it asks us to find, looking at an IQ test, it says some IQ tests are standardized to a normal model with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 16. You're asked to draw the normal model for this situation and describe what the rule predicts about the scores. So we'll just draw the bell-shaped curve. And what we'll do is we'll go out, it's centered at 100 because that's the mean, and then we're going to go 1, two and three standard deviations on either side so that we can get a handle on um, what what numbers kind of our break numbers are for the 68 percent of the population 95 percent of the population and 99 percent 99.7 percent of the population okay um, so we go one standard deviation to the right it's going to be 16 plus 100 or 116 one standard deviation to the left is going to be 84 so we can say then that 68% of the population, this middle percent of the population, has an IQ between 84 and 116. So what does that mean? What's left over here? Well, since the normal model is symmetric, that means that we have 100% um, uh, minus 68% or 32% left on either side here. So we have, in fact, um, sorry about that, this thing likes to act up. So this is 68%. If this is 100%, if the whole curve, underneath the whole curve is 100%, then you have 32% left on either side of this curve, right? And since we have symmetry, we can take 32% and divide by two and we will see that this right here has to be 16% and this has to be 16%. So we can say some interesting things. We can say that 16% of the population has an IQ above 116. Or we could say 84%, I mean, sorry, 16% of the population has an IQ below, um, uh, below, 16% uh, of the population has an IQ below 84. Now we could go out another standard deviation if we wanted. So we could do 116 plus 16 to make this would be 132. And then we could go down um, uh, here. That would be 84 minus 16, which is um, or, sorry, 68. 
And that would tell us then that 95% of the population has an IQ, 95% of the population has an IQ between 68 and 132. So 5% are left in these little tails right here, these tails. This is only 5%, which means this would have to be 2.5% of the population has an IQ above 132 because 95% is within two standard deviations. So that's within 68 and 132, which means you have 5% left to split between your two tails and 5% divided by two is two and a half. So two and a half percent of the population has an IQ above 132 and two and a half percent of the population has an IQ below 68. And then you could go out another standard deviation if you wanted, and you would say, all right, well, 148 would be another stand three standard deviations away from 100, or 52 would be three standard deviations below 100. And that is almost the entire population, 99.7% of the population has an IQ between 52 and 148. And so you have very small, it's just 0.3%. Um, if you divide that by two, 0.15% of the population has an IQ over 148. So that's why I don't know if you've ever heard of the Mensa group, but I think it might not even be, the restriction may not even be 148. It, because that's a very, very small percentage of the population. Now, in Excel, you can be even more precise than the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And you're going to use the function normal.dist, which for, stands for normal distribution. And then you're going to choose the data value that you want. And then you do comma the mean, comma the standard deviation. And it will return to you the area to the left of a particular data value. Um, and so the, we'll work a problem in just a second, but let's look at what you're going to do is you make a quick sketch of what you're trying to compute. Um, if you want all the values to the left or all the area to the left, you just do that normal distribution data value mean standard deviation formula. If you want all of the area to the right, well then you just do one minus the normal um, that formula. And if you want the area between two da data values, well, since the normal distribution um, re returns area to the left, since that function returns the area to the left, if you have a larger value, and let's just imagine what, the, what this means. So this formula in Excel, when you type it in, say you have um, some number here, right? So this is a number X. And when you type it into Excel using that formula, it's going to give you all of this area. So then if you have another number that say less than X, you call that Y, and you type it into Excel, it's going to give you the area to the left of Y. And so if you want the area between Y and X, if you subtract the answer that you got when you use the normal distribution for X from the answer that you got Oh, sorry, if you subtract the answer that you got from the normal, uh, using the normal distribution function of y from the number that you got for the larger one, then that'll leave you with just this middle part here. So that's how you do it when you're looking for kind of in between two middle values. So we'll do an example um, to help you. Now, it's going to return a probability because it's, a, it's an, a number between 0 and 1, but um, you just multiply it by 100 to get the percent. So let's look at an example. We'll look at a few examples. This might be kind of stressing you out. It's really not that bad. Okay, it says one year the scores on the statistics final exam have an approximately normal model distribution with a mean of 83 and a standard deviation of 5. About what proportion of the students get a B, which is between an 80 and a 90 in the course? Okay, so let's draw a picture first, and then we're going to use our, our computer to help us. All right, the mean... I don't know why it keeps doing this. The mean is 83. So we have a mean of 83. And um, we have a standard deviation of 5. So that means on either side of this 83, we could go 5. 
All right, so that would be like 88 on that side, and oh, let's see, that's 78, right? Okay, well, you know that 68% of the population got a score within 78 to 88. That's the rule. But that's not the question. We want to know what percent of the population got between 80 and 90. So we want to go a little bit this way and a little bit this way, and we want to find those areas. So in order to do that, what you're going to do is you're going to use your Excel function on your calculator. And I'll just kind of draw a visual of what you're going to do. You've got this centered at 83. The normal disk function on your calculator, when you use 90 as your x, is going to return all of the area to the left of 90. That's what it's going to return. And then the same model with an 83 here, but now an 80 in Excel, when you use that formula, it's going to return that area. And so if you subtract these two answers, that's going to give you the area between the 80, the, uh, 80 and 90. So in Excel, what you're going to do is you're going to say equals, and then you're going to do normal norm dot dist is a normal distribution, and then you're going to do the larger value, which is 90, comma the mean, comma the standard deviation, um, comma you just put a one because that's for cumulative, but you always put that one minus the normal distribution. Um, now we'll do the 80, comma the mean, comma the standard deviation. And when you um, type those numbers in Excel, it's going to give you a decimal and you multiply it by 100 to make it a percent. So if we come in here, I'll do it for you in Excel. We'll do a normal dist. So you do the equal sign, and you'll do normal, and notice it'll start to come up, so normal distribution, and you'll do the x, which is um, 90, comma, the mean, which was 83, comma, the standard deviation, which was 5, and then you always say yes to cumulative, so comma 1, and then minus the normal distribution, um, and then it's going to be the x value of 80, comma, the mean, which was 83, the standard deviation, which was 5, and then a 1. So that's going to give you, that answer is going to be the area in between 80 and 90. And in order to make that a percent, you're going to want to multiply that by 100. So you can just say equals, and then take your answer and multiply it by 100. So 64.5% of the class got a B between uh, 80 and 90. So that's how we would uh, work that problem. So again, it decided to, um, I don't know why this thing is doing this. It keeps doing that though. Okay, so normal dot distribution, we did. Um, the larger value, 90, comma the mean, comma the standard deviation, comma 1, minus um, the normal distribution, returning the area to the left if you used 80. Okay, and you put an equal sign in front. And then that number, you have to multiply by 100 to make a percent. And we ended up getting um, six. What did we get? Sixty-four point five was our answer. Okay. So um, let's go back to the marathon example and see what percent of the participants ran faster than me in the Tulsa and the Oklahoma uh, marathon. Okay. So if we want to see, this one's a little bit um, tricky. But uh, let me just draw the picture. The average time for Tulsa, I'll just do Tulsa. The average time for Tulsa was 267 minutes, about 267 minutes. And um, my time was 182 minutes, about. 
Okay, so that's 182. So we're wondering what percent is to the left of 182? So on this one, all we have to do is use that normal distribution, normal dot distribution, which would be, um, and then we do our data value, which here is 182, and I'll do it exactly in a minute, uh, or I'll, let me grab the numbers. So 182.77, the mean was 267.08, and the standard deviation was, let me see if I can show this on that screen. So, um, 182.77, the mean was 267.08, the standard deviation was 47.93, comma 1. That number is going to be the percent of, student, of participants who ran faster than me in Tulsa, and then um, and so if I did 100% min minus that, that would be the percent of people that ran slower than me. So let's see if we can find those percentages in Excel. So we'll come up and look at these values. And um, so this is going to be, if I do equals, and then I want to do the normal distribution. So I do norm dist, norm.dist, and my data value is the 182, so I'm going to grab this one comma, uh, the mean, which is in C3, comma, the standard deviation, which is in C4, comma, 1. And then I'm going to go ahead, because I want a percent, I'm going to go ahead and multiply that by 100. And so I can see that only 3.9% of the field of the runners ran faster than me, about 4%, which means 96% of the runners ran um, slower than me, so that's a pretty good grade. Okay, let's do the same thing for Oklahoma City. We'll do an equal sign. We'll do norm dot dist parenthesis. Okay, you do my data value, which was the 196.77, comma the mean, which is in cell E3, comma the standard deviation, which is in cell E4, um, and then comma one, and hit uh, close the parenthesis and hit enter. Uh, and then we, I wanted to multiply, I want to make that a percent, so I'm going to multiply that by 100, so times 100. So um, only 3.1% of the population ran faster than me in um, Oklahoma City. So uh, I did about, be I did better than 97% of the people in, um, in Oklahoma City, but only better than 96% of the runners in um in uh, Tulsa. But interestingly, if you were only to look at men and women, I did better than all the women in Tulsa and better than um, all but two of the women in uh, Oklahoma City. Okay, so uh, coming back to the notes, we've got some more examples to work. Um, sometimes we start with the areas and we need to find the corresponding z-score or even the original data value. And so um, if you're looking for a particular data point associated with a certain area or percent on the graph, what you want to do is no matter what they gave you, you want to calculate the area to the left as a decimal and then use the Excel function norm.inverse and then area to the left, comma mean, comma standard deviation. And the percentile is the area to the left. So um, you just make it a decimal and proceed. So let's see. It says, what z-score represents the first quartile in the normal model? Well, the first quartile is um, 0.25 of the data is to the left. 25% of the data is to the left. So when we're talking about z-scores, we have a mean. Remember, for a z-score, the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is equal to 1. So if we want to do this on our calculator or on our computer, we'll do equals norm dot inverse. The area to the left, which here is 0.25 because it's the first quartile, so 25% of the data is to the left. You have to make that a decimal, 0.25, comma the mean, which is 0, comma the standard deviation, which is 1. And so let's um, get that on our calculator. 
So I'll come in here on my computer. So I'm going to go equals norm. And notice this choice here, norm inverse. And then I'm going to do 0.25 because that's the probability or the area to the left. The mean is a 0. The standard deviation is 1. Close parenthesis and hit enter. And so um, the, the data value that's associated with it is negative 0.674 negative 0.674. Let's see if we can make some sense out of that number. So we get negative 0.674. So visually, what does that number mean? Well, you've got your normal model. And it's a standard normal model, so it's centered at zero. So you know, like if you went at negative one, say we just went negative one for fun, all right? And, and then this is positive one. You know 68% of the data is between negative one and one just by the standard, the rule. Which means that 32% is left to split between these tails. So you've got 16% above one standard deviation and 16% below one standard deviation. So if you want to know where, where is it about 0.25% is to the left, it should make sense to you that negative 0.674, which is maybe about right here, that data value would correspond to 25% of the area is to the left. Okay, so that's kind of what that's telling you. That tells you the data value that's associated with a certain percentile or area to the left, the normal inverse function. Okay, so this is our last example. It says, um, assume the cholesterol levels in adult American women can be described by a normal model with a mean of 188 and a standard deviation of 24. And you're asked to first draw and label the normal model. Okay, so I would come in to Excel here and I would just get my numbers that I need. Um, so I'll just have it up so I can kind of do the computations because I don't know that I can do that, addition, adding and subtracting in my head very well. So let me just clear this out. So I've got a mean, I'll just go ahead and write it. Mean was 188, standard deviation was, what they say, 24? Yes, 24. Okay, so if I want to go one standard deviation to the, and I'll do this kind of in order. Actually, how about I do, um, I'll do the three to the left, two to the left, one to the left, and then at 188. So I'm going to make a little, kind of a little picture here. So if I take the mean, so I'll do an equal sign. I'm going to take the mean, and then I'm going to subtract three times the standard deviation. 116 is three standard deviations to the left. Right now on um, this next cell, I'm going to take the mean. Oh, at first I have to do an equal sign to get it to do a computation. So I do equal sign and I'm going to take the mean and I'm going to subtract two times the standard deviations, which is this guy. And then, um, and then I'm going to go to the mean. So equals the mean. And then I'm going to do minus just one standard deviation. So I don't need to put that in. All right. And then I'm at the mean, which is 188. And now I'm going to go to the right. So I'm going to add one standard deviation, then add two, and then add three. So I'll do equals, and I'll just go ahead and write 188 plus 24, and then um, equals 188 plus two times 24. And then the last one there will be 188 plus three times 24. Oops, I see what happened is I forgot to put an equal sign there, so it didn't do the computation for me. So I'll put equal sign up in the formula bar, and it'll calculate it. Okay, so those are my numbers that would be at the bottom of my normal model. Let me see if I can get it to show up. On my normal curve, I'm going to have um, and it's centered at 180, and then I went one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. See, there's three of the standard deviations, there's two, there's one, and then here I went to the left. I subtracted one standard deviation, then two standard deviations, and then three. So I've got 116, 140, 164. 
Let me see if I can be snazzy here so that I can look at both of these at the same time. Okay, so drawing the model, I'm going to do um, the model is centered where? It's centered at 188, and then 68% of the people will have a, a um, blood pressure between 164 and 212 or of the uh, women, or no, not blood pressure, cholesterol. So I'm going to have to fix this because I put blood pressure as the thing. Sorry about that. Um, now we've got 140 to uh, 236. 96% of the women are going to have cholesterol between 140 and 236. And then finally, 99.7% um, of the population will have cholesterol levels between 116 and 260. So that's my a label of my model. Okay, and so let me fix this, silly me. So this is cholesterol is the model. Okay. So, um, and so we can think 68% of the women and then 95% uh, of the women have cholesterol levels between 140 and 236 and 99.7% of the women have cholesterol levels between um, 200 and, 116 and 260. So it should be pretty easy for you to answer question B, between what two cholesterol levels do you expect the central 95% of all women to have? Well, based on the rule, that would be between um, 140 and um, 236. And these are MG slash DLs is the unit, the way that they measure it. Okay, so that was easy. Now it says, what is the cutoff value for the highest 16% of cholesterol levels? Well, remember we talked about this. 68% of the data is between 164 and 212. So 100% minus 68% is 32% of the data is left to be split between the tails of the distribution. So if you're looking here within one standard deviation, this is 188. One standard deviation is 164 to 212. This is 68% of the data. So 100% minus 68% is equal to 32%. But that's split between the tails. Okay, so if you divide 32% by 2, that means you must have 16% on this side and 16% on this side. So 16% of the population has a cholesterol level above 212, and 16% of the population has a cholesterol level below 164. So the question then, what is the cutoff value for the highest 16% of cholesterol levels? That would clearly be this 212 um, mg slash DLs. Now it says about what percent of the women have cholesterol levels below 140 mg slash DLs? Well, the 140 was on this um, rule of thumb model as well. We had 188, and then this was 164, and then this was 140, right? And then we had numbers on this side, 212, and then this was uh, 236. So this right here was within two standard deviations. So this right here, this amount was 95% of the entire population. So if you've got the whole thing is 100%, 100% minus 95% is 5% that you're going to split again, right? Well. Five dollars divided by two is two dollars and fifty cents. So this is going to be two point five percent of the population is going to have a cholesterol level above two thirty six, and two point five percent of the population is going to have a cholesterol level below one hundred and forty. 
So the answer to about what percent of the women have cholesterol levels below 140, that's going to be 2.5%. Now, this one says about what percent of the women have cholesterol levels between 140 and 260, okay? Well, um, now we're going to have to do some thinking, probably. Okay, so we had the 188. Let me go back and see. And so then we went 212, and then there was 236, and then we added 24 to that, so that was 260. And then on this side, um, we were at 164 when we backed off, and then we were at 140, but then we did have a number below that, right? We had a third value, which was the 116. So you're going to have to do some thinking here on this one kind of just it's sort of just a picture in your head okay because you want to know between 140 and 260 so you want this number and this number now personally the easiest way I think to figure this out is to figure out what's left over in the tails add those two numbers together and um, and then subtract them from a hundred okay now, um, if we had gone from 116 to 260, that would have been 99.7% of the data. 99.7% is within, because that's our rule, 116 and 260. So that means if you do 100% minus 99.7%, that means 0.3% is split between those tails. So 0.3 divided by uh, 30 cents divided by 2, that's 15 cents. Right here, this amount right here is 0.15. And then this amount over on this side here, just this little part right here is 0.15 also, but I don't want to worry about that just right now. I really just wanted to get this this one, the area to the right of 260. Now, because I can get the area to the to the left of 140 if I recognize. Oh, I wish I hadn't done this. If I recognize that um, 140 is two standard deviations to the left. So 236 and 140 represent 95% of the data, right? That's 95%. So you've got 5% to split between the tails. So this amount is 2.5, and then this white amount here is 2.5%. So the area to the left of 140 is 2.5%, and the area to the right of 260 is 0.15%. So the area that's not yellow, not yellow, right, is 2.5% um, plus 0.15% or 2.65%. That's all the area that we don't want. The area that we do want is what's, what is in between. So if we did 100% and take away 2.65%, that's going to give us the answer. So if you can go into Excel and do that, you can just do, in any little cell, you can just do equals 100 minus 2.65. So 97.35% of the population has um, is the yellow area. So you had to do quite a bit of thinking, but it was kind of just drawing and dividing, and there's really many ways that you could answer this problem, and so that was just the way that I thought. Okay, now, F is giving us some trouble, because in F, they want to know what percent of the women do you expect to have cholesterol levels over 200, and 200 is not on our normal model, but we can do this with Excel. We've got 188, 200 is somewhere here, but we don't know what it is exactly. What we're asked for 
is this percentage. Now, Excel, the normal distribution function in Excel gives us the area to the left. So it will give us the amount below 200. So if we do, and it'll give it to us as a decimal, so if we do one minus that area, it will give, that will be the equal to the yellow. So if I do, the Excel function is one minus normal distribution, and that's because the normal distribution function returns the area to the left. So if I want the area to the right, because I want it over, then I have to do one minus. All right, the data value of 200, the mean of 188, the standard deviation of 24, and then you just do comma 1. And this answer is going to be as a decimal, so we have to multiply that by 100 to make it a percent. So you can say times 100. You can do it all in one line if you want, or you can do it, you know, in, this, in the second line. So let's come up in Excel and see what we've got there. So in Excel, we'll just do an equal sign, and then I'm just going to do, oh, well, I'll go ahead and, okay, I'll do a parenthesis, one minus norm, and when I start typing it, it finds it for me. So normal distribution, and then I'm going to do 200, comma, 188, comma, 24, comma, 1. Close parenthesis. Then I'm going to close that whole parenthesis and multiply that answer by 100, because that'll give me, that'll make it a percent. And so I've got 30.85% or 30.9% of the population is going to be in this yellow region. So again, if they want the area to the right or the area above a particular data value number, you have to use one minus on your um, on your Excel command. But if they want the area to the left, you just do um, the normal distribution button. And I um, discuss that in these notes right here, uh, right in here. Those are the commands that you use with Excel. Okay, and so then now it says estimate the interquartile range of cholesterol levels. Ugh. So what we have to figure out is we want, um, now what we want is to figure out what percent, no, so the interquartile range, we want the middle 50%, we want the numbers for the middle 50% of the um, uh, cholesterol levels. So we remember that IQR, sorry, IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1. So we have to find the number that's associated with Q3. We need to find the, the cholesterol level that is associated where 75% where of the data is to the left. Okay, so Q3 means 75th percentile or 0.75 to the left. And Q1 is the 25th percentile, which is 0.25 to the left. So let's go ahead and figure out what Q3 is. Well, when you're working these problems, um, when you're looking for the data value um, and know the percent, that's when you use the um, norm inverse button on your calculator. So you're going to do norm inverse, norm.inverse, and you'll do 0.75 comma the mean, which was 188, comma the standard deviation, which is 24. And then to find Q1, the data value that's associated with the 25th percentile, you're going to use the norm inverse button and then you use 0.25 comma 188 comma 24. So I know that this is kind of overwhelming to you, but just remember there's really only two commands that you learned um, in this that you're learning right now and that is 
the norm distribution, which on Excel will give you the area to the left. It'll give you the percent if you, if you multiply it by 100. And the norm inverse, that's when you're given the percent and you want to find the data value that's associated with that percent. So if we come in here to our calculator, and I'll just clear some of this stuff out. So I'm just going to clear all these out. So I don't, or I'll just clear this. Okay. And so then I'm going to do, uh, when that was, I'll clear this too. Okay. Um, I'll just pick a cell. I'll do equals. And then norm inverse is the second function down here. And the probability that they have is 0.75. It's the area to the left. That's what that means. Comma the mean, which is 188. Comma the standard deviation, which is 24. And I close my parentheses and hit enter. So 204 is the cholesterol level that 75% of the women have um, a cholesterol level uh, at or below 204. Now, if I want to find Q1, I use the same formula. So I'll do an equal sign and I'll do norm. And norm inverse is this one right here. So I'll double click on it. And now instead of 75, I'm going to use 0.25, comma the mean, which was 188, comma the standard deviation, which is 24. And I close that parenthesis and hit enter. So 170, well, we could round that to about 172 is the cutoff level for 25%. So 25% of the population has a cholesterol level, sorry, uh, yes, a cholesterol level uh, below 172. So I get 204 for this one and 172 for that one. So finally, the IQR is going to be equal to Q3, which is 204, minus Q1, which is 172. And so you can just come in here and you can just say equals, and we can be snazzy, we can grab this cell and then subtract this cell and then hit enter. So we get about 32.3 or we'll just round it to 32. So 32 is the interquartile range. So um, the spread on either side of 188 is 32 um, for, for this problem. Now finally it says about what value are the highest 15% of women's cholesterol levels? Okay. Now, this, the formula, so we're looking for a data value, and we're looking, when we're looking for a data value, we're going to use this normal inverse button, but the normal inverse button requires that you type in the area to the left. They want the area to the left. That's what it requires, comma the mean, comma the standard deviation. Now, the problem asks for the cutoff value so that 15% of the women are to the right. So it's the highest 15%, okay? So you have to use your little noggin and say to yourself, okay, well, if 15% are to the right, the lower part of this would be 100% minus 15% or 85% of the population is to the right. 15%, I mean, is to the left. If 15% is to the right, then 85% is to the left. So um, the area that you're, the formula, in the formula, in order to get this data value, you have to put area to the left, so you're going to have to put 0.85, comma the mean, comma the standard deviation, to get the answer that they want. So you can't use that 0.15. So we'll do norm inverse, and remember you have to do an equal sign, norm inverse. Um, the probability which was 0.85, comma the mean, which was 188, comma the standard deviation, which was 24. And then, so that is 212, really almost 213, if we round to the nearest whole number. 213 is the data value for the highest 15% of women's cholesterol levels. So don't let this stuff freak you out. Um, you can either use the rule, and on the, on the homework, it's going to ask you to use the rule, which was the 68.95.99.7 rule. And when they're doing that, they're going to have to give you numbers that are fall exactly one, exactly two, or exactly three standard deviations. Or if you want to try and get these values 
um, numbers that aren't exactly on a particular one, two, or three standard deviation, that's when you're going to use either the normal inverse button or the normal distribution button. You use the normal distribution when you're asked for what percent of the data. Um, you use the normal inverse button when they, they ask you for what data value and they give you the percent. So if they give you the percent, then you're going to use the normal inverse button. If they ask for the percent, you're going to use the normal dot distribution button. And um, if you try to look at the show me example, they're going to do these with tables, which I think you can read about it and learn how to do it that way with a table, but I kind of like my way better using Excel. So there are other ways to find these numbers, and it's up to you, obviously, because you're taking the class online, of how you want to do it, but I hope the Excel method uh, makes sense to you. Okay?